Um, now, here, the bond we're breaking here, this number uh, is, the, is at the number four. So that's, what, that's what's going to be different between these two pictures. So how is the number four in the starting material, how should the number four in the starting material be different from this number four in the product? It should be connected. Well, they're separate, right now the two and the four are separate, but they need to be connected in the product. Right. Now, I, I guess I didn't uh, make that clear. So yeah, in the product, they'll be connected. Yeah. But my question is, uh, in the product, the number four and the two, so in the product, the number four was attached to the number two. Well, what's the number four attached to in the starting material? If it was a grid yard. Um, FGBR. Okay, that's what I was getting at there. Remember, we're not trying to just redraw the product because we already have a picture of the product here. We're trying to draw a starting material that could lead us to the product. Okay. Um, now we're kind of done now. This is the answer. This is what we were struggling to come up with all along. This is the reagent that we could add to this. Okay. This is the reagent that we could add so to this. So you just draw the exact carbon chain that it has, and then. It you just take off the, v, the VR and the MG and attach it to the um, electric bill of carbon. Right. Well, that happens to be the method that worked for this particular synthesis problem. However, every synthesis problem is different. So you can't simply memorize, uh, erase this, and write that in. Instead, you have to think about the thought process that we went through. Uh, and the thought process was, again, to ask, we know that it's the number four carbon that's going through a change here. So you have to ask, what did the number four look like before it turned into the product? What did the number four look like before it turned into the product? Well, before it turned into the product, this was part of a grid yard, which means, and so the number four was attached to the uh, uh, magnesium bromide. So it's important to see that there's no, um, there's no formula that we can memorize that will get synthesis problems right. Instead, there's a thought process that we have to get comfortable with. The thing to see is that this is kind of like doing a puzzle. Yeah. We're trying to do a puzzle, so we have to be in a puzzle-doing uh, uh, frame of mind. Remember that your first guess, your first guess was that we should add this reagent. Now, I can kind of see why you would think that, because this fragment has four carbons, and this fragment has four carbons. But the problem is, these four carbons are not arranged in the same way as the four carbons over here. So I this just assume there had to be another step that would get us to the ah, okay. to make more sensation. Right. And one thing to keep in mind is you can add any reagents you like. So you might as well add a reagent that looks as much like the product as possible. You might as well add a reagent that has the same formation uh, as the product. We're, we're allowed to assume that we can add any reagent we want in a synthesis problem. So you might as well add a reagent that it has as, as similar as possible in its carbon chain to what you're trying to get here. Okay, so again, the numbering was crucial here. So like I said, we have to think about the thought process. So the thought process here again was, so you did a good job with your numbering. Then um, it helps to put in these squiggles to see which bonds are breaking. All right, and then we simply have, uh, then we have to look at, uh, at retrosynthesis is really the best way to go here, which means looking at the product here, uh, and you can see that because of the squiggle, this final product started as two separate fragments. This final product must have been, in, uh, in, over here, it must be two separate fragments. And you have to draw, what did the fragments look like before they became the product? Well, it helps to just ask what reaction takes us here. Well, we know the reaction that's going to take us here is ketone plus grignard. We know the reaction that's going to take us here is a ketone plus a grignard, so we should draw one of the fragments as a ketone, and we should draw the other fragment as a grignard. So it definitely helps to actually say in words what are the functional groups that we have to start with uh, in order to, uh, to uh, get to this over here. So let's see what our final answer would be. Our final answer is that this is a two-step synthesis. First, you would have to add this grid yard, and then we know we have to do the aqueous workup. Uh, H3O plus, we, I think we saw last time another name for that is aqueous workup. Uh, that gives us the protonation. <coughs> OK. All right, can I erase this? Yeah. All right. OK. You have this in your notes? Okay, let's just go through this together. Um, all right, so remember, uh, again, this is a synthesis problem. They're giving you the starting material 
and the product, and then we have to add step by step what reagents it'll take to get us from the starting material to the product. Um, so um, a good way to do that, remember, is to take your piece of paper, put the starting material on the far left and the product on the far right so that you have plenty of room to work horizontally uh, between them. Remember, it might be even better to make your, uh, hold your paper horizontally so you can put the starting material over here and the product over here. You don't have to recopy it right now, but that's a good thing to think about for the future. Remember, not to try to save space, you might need a whole piece of paper for each problem. Okay. Um, so let's go through systematically what the steps are for synthesis. So a good first step is to look for a landmark. So do you see any landmark when you're ready? Um, the reagent that we hexane ring attached to the oxygen. That's right. Now actually, um, which of those is the better landmark? I would say that the hexane ring is not a great landmark because there's two hexane rings in the product. And it's not obvious at the beginning whether this hexane ring is this one or this one over here. Um, so on the other hand, I think, like you said, the oxygen is a good landmark because there's only one oxygen in the product. So let's focus on that oxygen as the landmark. Remember, we're trying to find, what do I mean by a landmark? I mean something in the starting material that is, up, uh, I mean an atom in the starting material that seems to be the same as an atom in the product. What you need to find is an atom in the starting material that seems the same as an atom in the product. Uh, we might guess that this ring is the same as this ring, but we can't be sure. Maybe it's this ring over here, but we can be pretty sure that this oxygen is the same as this oxygen. Now, this is always really a guess. Sometimes you might think that two atoms are the same and they're not, uh, but you have to take a guess and see how it works. So we'll guess that these two oxygens are the same. All right, and then that helps you to find other atoms that are the same. For example, if these two oxygens are the same, then it seems like a pretty good bet that these two carbons are the same. Well, anytime two atoms are the same, you give them the same number. We saw, as we saw on the previous problem, this is not an IAPAC number, it's just a reference number, so we know those two carbons are the same. Okay. All right, uh, and I'll go ahead and number this carbon as number two. Now let's try to find the number two carbon in this picture. Well, do you think that the number two carbon is on the left here or on the right? Left. On the left. How do you know? Not because the number two is on the left here. Things could easily shift from left to right. You can tell because the number two carbon is part of a ring over here. So most likely, the number two carbon should still be part of a ring. Again, you can't be sure about that, but that's a good guess. All right, so this is the step-by-step -step process. And we probably don't need to number the rest of these carbons here. So is this carbon from the starting material? No, it doesn't seem like this carbon's from the starting material. So you also want to try to identify the carbons in the product that are not from the starting material. And you can give them new numbers. So I'll call this 3, 4, and 5. That's probably as many numbers as we need over here. So you're trying to identify carbons in the starting materials that you're guessing are the same as carbons in the product, and then give them corresponding numbers. And you also want to try to identify carbons in the product that were not in the starting material, and give them brand new numbers. So that's the systematic approach. OK, so that gives us our uh, numbers here. All right, uh, and then it might help to say, which, which, which are the atoms here that are losing or gaining bonds when you're ready? Which are the atoms that are losing or gaining bonds? with the number one. Good. Um, and what are some new bonds that are forming? It's forming a bond with hydrogen. That's true. And then between the one carbon, this new bond formed with the three carbon. OK. Yeah, it's pretty clear now that we put in the numbers that there's a new bond here between the one and the three. OK. What do these little squiggles tell us? Well, these little squiggles tell us that this part of the product must have come from a different intermediate than this part of the product. This part of the product must have come from someplace different than this part of the product over here. So now we're going to uh, work backwards, doing retrosynthesis. And we're going to ask, what intermediates would we combine to get this product over here? Well, start by just describing the general reaction that's going to happen. Well, what two types of functional groups do you think are going to be reacting with each other that are going to give us this over here? Um, the Grignard, or a Grignard and the, um, the aldehyde. Because we've learned that a Grignard plus an aldehyde does give you an alcohol like this. 
By the way, how do we know we're using a Grignard? Because there's a new carbon-carbon bond. Again, uh, anytime you're forming a new, there's a new carbon-carbon bond in the product. Well, at this point in the course, this is just about the only way we've seen to form a carbon-carbon bond. Just about the only way we've seen to form a carbon-carbon bond is a Grignard plus an aldehyde. So we're pretty sure those are the things that we're combining over here. Okay. Um, well, then, what I want to do is now, remember we're working backwards. I want to draw what these two parts of the product looked like in the previous step. I want to draw what these two parts of the product looked like before. Well, what do you think this used to be? Did this used to be the Grignard or the aldehyde? Aldehyde. This used to be the aldehyde. So I'm going to draw that fragment over here. You already said we were going to break this bond too. Now, so far, I've just kind of recopied it from here. So now go ahead and make any changes that you need to to make it look like an aldehyde. All right, no problem. If this used to be an aldehyde, it used to have a double bond here. And we might draw this hydrogen because people usually draw the aldehyde hydrogen. 